Hey everybody, welcome into Milestone Sports. My name is George Knapper, his name is Vince Lomascolo. Uh, today we're going to be doing a very NBA uh, heavy show, basically uh, dealing with some of the positive and negative uh, fallout of the 76ers and Nets uh, trade. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the upcoming uh, NFL Draft Combine um, coming up this week. Uh, all of the uh, you know skills positions and exciting uh, positions will be uh, on display and we're going to be talking about whose who's stock needs to rise um, uh, based on their performance. Um, but we're going to start in the NBA, like I said. Uh, James Harden, uh, through the two games that he's played after this All-Star break for the 76ers, uh, have been phenomenal. Uh, you know, the 27th against the Knicks scores 29 points in 39 minutes. 25th against the Timberwolves, 27 points in 35 minutes. Uh, and one of the things that I've been noticing is the the assists he gives to uh, Joel Embiid while making his own points, creating his own shots. I mean, he's he's just showing you like on the right team with the right pieces around him, he is that complete player and uh, just an outstanding uh, force. So I guess my question is, I'll throw it to you, Vince, and, and you can you know talk about what you like about uh, you know Harden with the 76ers so, so far also. But where do you see this team going? I mean, what? how far do you think they will get? Um, I think that they've got a really good shot at getting to the finals, which means that they uh, have a really good shot at winning the finals. I think uh, really what we've seen over the last several years is that the West and the East, you can sort of make a claim one way or the other that one's uh, stronger than the other. But this isn't like the days when LeBron just dominated the East and we called the, the East a cakewalk. Um, it's LeBron, a LeBron definitely ain't dominating right now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and the, I mean, we can get into debate about uh, the East and when LeBron dominated it, if it was actually that easy or if he was just that good. Um, but that's a whole separate story. It's a very balanced league right now. I think we'd say like right. East to West, pretty balanced. So the point being, if the Sixers can get to the finals, that means the Sixers have a shot at winning the finals. I think they're a true contender. That's how far I think they can get. Uh, what impresses me about this version of James Harden, I'm going to compare directly from Brooklyn to Philadelphia right now, and we'll leave Houston, um, put that aside for a second. In Brooklyn, he didn't quite have a role. He did, but he didn't. Like the, at the end of the day, it, like with Kyrie, with Kevin Durant, it's like you got two really excellent ball handlers on that team. Um, in addition to James Harden, that like right. who, who's the one bringing it up the floor, who's running the offense, like Kevin Durant is the most prolific scorer that we've seen in this era. Um, I think uh, we'd have to say, um, or at least certainly since the post Kobe era. Um, sure. And so, um, yeah. And so like a lot of times you're deferring to Kevin Durant um, and Kyrie Irving, we know what he can do. Um, so really, I mean, obviously Joel Embiid is also an amazing scorer, but he's not like the kind of scorer that like, you know, he's running the ball up the court. He's initiating the offense and things like that. Like he, even when James Harden wasn't there, he was relying on other guards and things to get him the ball down on the block, uh, to score. And so what we're seeing is like James Harden is filling a role that wasn't really filled before. Like they had good guards, but like, he is like their elite guard who can really, you know, get Joel the ball when he, when it needs to be there exactly the way it needs to be there. And also someone who can score the way James Harden does. So it opens up all these opportunities because it's not like anyone has to debate like whose role is who again. Like, you know, I think we see like when we saw the, the Warriors, it was like Steph and Clay just like took a step back and K Katie took over. Like that was like the most fluid we've ever seen a team be able to like debate their roles, even though they're all pretty hot shot scorers. Um, this just sort of seems like uh, a, perfect match versus you know the Lakers trying to put stuff together in weird combinations or other like we've seen it with the Celtics too like just trying to put together all-star talent but doesn't quite work and then the last iteration was the Nets and again didn't really quite work this is somewhere where James Harden has his role um and it's not like and so to bring Houston back into it James Harden's role before was to be the one like above everybody else um, versus like, yeah. I think on Philadelphia, he doesn't have to be the number one scorer, but he's the number one guard. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's the really important part. He's now paired with as a number one guard with a number one big man, whether you want to say forward center, whatever he had, like, there's no disputing, like, 
who gets the ball when, but you both are top level talents. So like in Houston, he didn't have that top level talent with him. You can, we can talk about Chris Paul, but like, it wasn't really like the same kind of scoring uh, situation there. And in Brooklyn, he had a ton of talent, but like everybody sort of filled the same role. And so this is like sort of the happy median between the two. He has a role and he has extra talent in areas that he does not excel. Well, and to me, it's all about they helped Joel Embiid, right? I mean, Joel Embiid before this was having an MVP caliber season and literally uh, having to do it all. You know, I mean, having to run the offense, having to run the offense while creating his own shot. And now you have somebody that if he's not quite running the offense, he's at least uh, 50% doing that. Because like I said about the assists, like there are some where I look at and he's got Harden has this insane level of like peripheral vision that he just sees Embiid coming up the floor, like right to his side. And he just does a little behind the back pass and, and Embiid goes for the dunk. I, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's an incredible pairing because if they can, if they can uh, continue to be consistent with that, teams are not ready for that. Teams have not prepared for that duo. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they haven't had time to prepare for that duo because it, that wasn't how it was in the off season. Mm-hmm. And it's just a phenomenal pairing. I mean, getting, not only getting Harden, you know, out of a situation he clearly wanted out of, but so, you know, so there's going to be that motivation there, but also he's got the motivation to win a ring because they know they can. And I, I honestly, I know there's other good teams in the Eastern conference and obviously uh, the Warriors and the and the Suns and certain teams in the West will have something to say about it, but genuinely, I don't see how you can stop the 76ers at this moment in time. I really, really don't. It's going to take I, I, at this moment in time. I do think it will be like 76ers Warriors, and it's going to take. They're capable of it, but it's going to take a phenomenal performance from the Warriors to to stop them. Um, there's there's just a level of of excellence that they're displaying this year and Harden now, uh, you know, joining that and not even like, they didn't really even have to lose anything. Cause as we said, Simmons wasn't giving them anything. So right. it's just like, they get this huge plus, uh, that teams are just not going to be prepared for. Yeah. I think the one way that I could see them getting stopped. And I don't think that we, even before Harden went to the Sixers, we talked about enough is the Milwaukee Bucks. I think Giannis Mm -hmm. is still that guy. Um, That's not to say that the Bucks are, like, I think I would pick the Sixers over the Bucks, but that's not, like, I'm saying they're definitely a threat, absolutely a threat to uh, beat them in the Eastern Conference Finals, depending on how the seeding and everything works out. Um, And so I would, I'd be cautious of sort of, like, there are some people that are putting the Sixers as prohibitive favorites. I think it's still a little too early after the All-Star break to just, like, for sure say, like, they're the guys no matter what, because I think uh, Giannis is still just a monster um, and that's going to be hard uh, to stop. So, I think in the playoffs, I would take them against the field in the Eastern Conference. Mm-hmm. I would have to see how the team that wins the West is playing up to that point to say I will take them in the finals. But I think we're both in agreement that they have a, a gigantic shot to uh to make the finals it's it's not it's no longer like a pipe dream for them they've they've found this winning combination right yeah no i i think they definitely have a shot whereas before i like there was no shot for the 76ers honestly like i mean the last time and they they were so dysfunctional before i mean even yeah even without simmons not playing they were they're dysfunctional yeah so i mean at the end of the day like i definitely think this is this is the team if James Harden can't get it done with this team with Joel Embiid this way then James Harden's never going to get a ring like yeah I just don't I don't see it um and so I hope he does because like I think I think while I don't have him ranked as highly as some other people I know overall he is underrated actually because of sort of his playoff woes and I'd like him to sort of overcome that um there are people that put his name somehow next to Kobe Bryant. And I'm like, no, just no. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> like, uh, so, but 
uh, in terms of just his overall legacy, I would like to see him get a ring uh, or two. And so I'm, I'm very excited to see this. It's interesting that you brought up, and I just want to talk about this briefly because we're going to move on to another topic that's not as related to this. You had brought up the Warriors coming out of the West, but like, so do you think the Warriors over the Suns or what, where are you at right now on that? I would say the Warriors over the Suns based solely on the collection of talent that they still have. Okay. Right? I mean, they, they've not lost too many pieces of what they were before other than KD. Right. right. So okay. I, I just, you know, not having watched too much of the Warriors this season, I know they're having a terrific season. I've seen, you know, certain highlights and whatnot. And obviously we know who Steph Curry is. So mm -hmm. I just, I can't elevate them over the suns at this point, especially when, and I, and I, you know, I thank you for bringing up the Warriors versus the Suns because my Pelicans destroyed uh, the Suns on the first game back from the All Star break, beating them mm -hmm. by 15 points. So I'll just I'll just leave it at that. We may address the Pelicans at a later date, but um, you know, like the the Suns have these moments where they where they kind of drift a little bit. They kind of coast, and I mm -hmm. think that game was an example of that. And and um, you know. I, I, are they are they, you know, locked out of of uh, winning the Western Conference Finals in my mind? No, but I just I would take the Warriors ahead of them because the Warriors don't have as many games like that, and they also mm -hmm. have like a stronger roster overall, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I'm in the same boat. I just like it's sort of surprising to me because like I think the Suns are still that team. But it's surprising to me that people do agree with me on that point, that I think the Warriors are the team to beat in the West um, after having, you know, that rocky little bit since KD left and the injuries with Clay and then with Steph. Um, I think it's like, honestly, this might be sort of one of those dynasties that we talk about where it's like, oh, they had like this run and then there was like a little chunk in the middle and then they went on yet another run. Um, I think that's definitely very possible with the Warriors. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Well, I think a lot of the main reason people underestimate them right now is because of that that desire for parity, right, mm -hmm. in, in any league, right? Like the Warriors were so dominant for so long that it's like, oh, if they fell off a little bit because KD left or a little bit in the sense of like, you know, uh, they had they had all the success in the world and then they had like, a season or two where it wasn't great right mm -hmm. so like like patriots fans for example like yeah they're not used to not being in the playoffs right they're not right. used to going to the playoffs like they did and uh losing in the first round like they did right mm -hmm. and so it, it's it's i think it's that people would rather see um dynasties come and go or like mini dynasties in that sense right then then a, one franchise just dominate the entire league, which which I can, you know, I can empathize with being, a, you know, an NFL fan and not a Brady fan, right? right? But but I think it's, you know, there has to be some objectivity there uh, just when you look at the teams and how they're performing this season. You know, yeah. they're, they're all, you know, the teams at the top all are great. And, you know, realistically, uh, especially in the East, any one of those, or, or excuse me, in the West, any one of those teams could make it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, when you talk, we start talking about playoff basketball and who's, who has the most experience, uh, who can sustain over a period of games, which you need to do because these are series, not uh, single elimination games for the most part other than the play-in. Right. Um, I, I just think that, you know, you, you have to split these hairs. And mm -hmm. when you look at the Warriors, to me, they're just a hair better uh, right. than, than Phoenix. Yeah, no, that's definitely a valid point. And like you said, we'll get back to this because I think we'll have a segment next week on the Pelicans. But that is why I think we differ on the Pelicans is because like I am sort of splitting that hair in terms of that experience level and everything else like that. And it's not just like the Lakers to me that like obviously they're imploding, um, but the other teams other than the Lakers that are ahead of the Pelicans are right there neck and neck with the Pelicans, whether it's the Spurs or the, uh, the trailblazers or any of those guys is that they just like have that little bit of experience. Even if, you know, um, 
the Trailblazers lost McCollum, they still have Damian Lillard there who like, and they've all sort of been a group together. They haven't gone very far through the playoffs, but they've always sort of gotten there with Dame. Um, and so I expect, I just like, in terms of those splitting those hairs, like you're saying, like I, every team that I sort of stack the Pelicans up against as of right now, I'm open to that changing, but I just like, I see them all sort of like having that edge, just like Greg Popovich with the Spurs. Like, I think they're going to go a bit on a run because their schedule remaining is pretty easy. And like pop has a history of like winning easy games. Like, sure. and so, yeah. Well, and I'm willing to admit that part of my enthusiasm about the Pelicans is because I'm a fan of theirs. I'm right. a fan <laughs> of that team. Right. So it's a little bit of Homerism, but when you, I will say this, when you compare them love, to the Sorry, players, really quick. I love how you say Homerism because it's like you're talking about Homer, the poet or writer, like, and it, but you're actually talking about. Like, I'm not talking about Homer, the poet. What are you talking about? No, I know. Um, what the heck? Um, but, um, but no, I mean, when you compare them to, to the Blazers, I think when you look at that, like they got McCollum and they got Tony Snell. Right. Yeah. So that I think what what uh, makes me feel secure in thinking that they're going to end, um, you know, a higher seed than the Blazers is because they have that level of of knowledge of of potentially how to beat them. Um, but they're also just playing so well right now as a team, like since since the All Star break. And, and frankly, even in some of the games they they lost once they had McCollum and before the All Star break, like. You just look at the, everybody seems to know their role, seems to know their job. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and even even if they are not in the play-in tournament, you know, they're they're on the outside looking in. I, I still you have to credit the job that Willie Green has done with this yeah. team. I mean, I mean, nobody thought they would they would be relevant at all. Yeah. And and you know, for them to do all this without Zion, and then for them to get McCollum and Snell, which which you know, validates the job that Green has done. Um, you know, them turning Valanchunas into a star and Brandon Ingram, uh, you know, being consistent and all of these things. Devontae Graham uh, being a consistent shooter for them. Um, mm. You know, I just think the world of the job that he's done. So, so in that sense, it is a bit of homerism, but it is also, uh, there are, again, it's kind of splitting hairs, right? Like I've seen some, slight improvements from what they were before the all-star break in these past two games. Like they, they have been better equipped now with the benefit of that time to practice of getting McCollum uh, more involved in a more consistent role. So we shall see, we shall see everything that happens with, uh, with the Pelicans and the 76ers, obviously, um, the team on the other end of the big uh, 76ers and Nets trade is, of, of course, the Brooklyn Nets. And I wanted to talk about uh, this this uh, strange uh, occurrence with uh, Kyrie Irving's vaccination status. And in the past, when we've talked about it, we've kind of uh, laid into Kyrie or, or criticized him. But this, I think, is a bit of hypocrisy on the city of New York on their part. Um, I just don't understand this. So, so basically they're still not, he's still unvaccinated, but they're Mm -hmm. still not allowing him to, uh, play home games in the Barclays center, despite the fact that they are, uh, lifting vaccine mandates, um, for a large, um, large portions of the populace, uh, which they said includes entertainment. Um, now when Eric Adams, mayor of New York City, spoke about this, he, he said that uh, making an exception for Kyrie Irving would send the wrong message to the rest of the city. What yeah. I don't understand is how can you bring, uh, you know, paying customers into that stadium and are you going to check if they're all masked, if they're all vaccinated? I doubt it. And you're gonna right. and you're gonna bring um, visiting uh, players into that stadium for games as they've done this entire rest of the season. Who are some of them not vaccinated? Obviously, the NBA has a much higher rate of vaccination than than a lot of other sports. But 
uh, it makes no sense to me because you've already, like I said, you've already had those players on the floor. You've had those fans in the stadium and you're going to have more probably. Uh, to me, this just lends credence to Irving's argument that this is somehow, you know, some kind of uh, rights issue, which I don't agree with. But it, you know, we were talking pre-show about uh, could this go to court? And I said, I mean, I feel like if this continues to go on, Irving might have a case, you mm-hmm. know? So what, what's your perspective on all this? Cause I, I just think this is just really odd. Yeah. I think, um, I think that there was a case to be made for New York early on in this. I didn't fully agree with it at the time, but like, there was like, a, there was an opening there, which is just like, let's like have New Yorkers be vaccinated because we, we can't control right. the people that come into our city, but we can control ourselves. Right. So like, and because everybody that came into the arena was supposed to be vaccinated, uh, you know, obviously people can fake vaccine cards and whatnot, but on the whole, like people were supposed to be vaccinated coming in there. So like, it makes sense that like the home team would be held to that same standard that the fans were being held to. And, you know, the away team, they can't really control that because like, you're not like a part of our business here in the state of New York. You're just coming here to play a game. Um, so like at the time you could make the argument, I wouldn't have, but you could have made the argument that it was a valid rule. Vaccine mandate is lifted in New York. Um, and so like for all those fans and everything like that. So if Kyrie Irving can attend a basketball game as a fan and sit courtside and right. not get vaccinated, but can't play a game unvaccinated, that makes no sense. Like he, he should be able to play games now at home because no one else is being required and no one else that's showing up at that stadium is being required to be vaccinated. This is New York trying to like make a statement optics wise. And honestly, like, this is why, like, I don't want to get too political on this, but like, this is why people have these perceptions of New York, of California, of Massachusetts, sure. things like that. Like it, it is silly stuff like this. It's like when they're actually being common sense, like early on in the phases of these things, they're not getting credit for like, the early pandemic, they like they did have a lot of like the better policies and things like that in place. But then like they cling to this random stuff. And it's what gives them a reputation for like for it not being common sense and just being them overreacting um, because they cling to things too long like this because they want to win the like the PR battle. But what ends up happening is they actually lose it um, overall. And so it, it's just really unfortunate. Well, and it's what you get with certain establishment politicians, right? I mean, I mean, establishment Republicans, basically. And I, and again, I don't want to get too political, but in the sense that establishment Republicans basically have uh, protested against vaccine mandates or, or things that would, you know, lessen the impact of COVID-19 on the whole, right? And the, this is, like you said, this is what makes people distrustful of Democrats because sometimes they will pick and choose, right? They pick and choose like when to be uh, uh, outraged about something and and when to back off. Now, a lot of that's based on who their donor base is. And, you know, that's a whole different discussion. But in this instance, they have picked and chose Kyrie to target. Now, again, I don't think that Kyrie is like being, you know, unfairly targeted or unfairly criticized for uh, not being vaccinated. In my opinion, everybody who's responsible should get vaccinated. I I think it's just a smart thing to do when what have you. But as I said before, I think if this were to somehow reach a court case, I think he would have a case because it's, I mean, it's, it's hypocrisy to say like, oh, everybody else is fine, but you cannot come, you cannot come in, you cannot, you know, come here and, and work for us. Uh, it, it's just so odd. And, you know, you made the distinction between the, the broader city and the arena. If it was about the city, maybe that would make more sense if he was like actually a public employee but mm-hmm. like, it's very odd to me that the city gets to say, uh, okay, well we've, well, we've lifted the vaccine mandate, but like, 
we're going to pick and choose individuals who need to abide by, uh, you know, right. laws that we previously put in place that we're saying, okay, it doesn't matter now. Exactly. Like that, that was that's the part, the part that makes no sense. When I said the city part, what I was talking about was early on, because there were other sectors, not only sports arenas right. that were right. saying employees of those things needed to be vaccinated. So like right. you could make the argument that like, he's an employee of a company within the city of New York okay, like you have to abide by the rules that everybody else that is an employee, even though the people that you're playing across don't have to because, but that's because they're an employee of another market and they're just coming for the day. You actually like practice and work here full time. Now that that standard is not being held across the rest of the city for those other industries and sectors, it should not apply to the Brooklyn Nets and Kyrie Irving anymore either. But right. But if it's about the spread of COVID as opposed to the optics, mm -hmm. then why is why is Kyrie as a human different from other humans who have come into that arena, whether they be on visiting teams or fans or fans that are going to come after the vaccine right. is lifted? Right. Yeah. Why is he what what is so different about him uh, that, that do they think he in particular is going to spread it more than others might? No, no it's, yeah, it's, it's a, literally it's a, a silly, it's a silly attempt to win some kind of optics battle that, uh, you know, frankly, the moment's passed on, right. on, on the sort of optics of that. So if you, yeah. and, and, and you, by making that decision, not you, Vince, mm -hmm. but you, the, uh, the city of New York have made that decision that largely the optics battle doesn't matter in that mm -hmm. sense because you're going to lift the vaccine mandate, right? So why why is it like 99% uh, one way in terms of optics, but then when it's when Kyrie is involved, it's completely the other way? And I honestly, this may sound crazy to people, but I honestly would compare it to the Kaepernick situation in in this sense. They drummed him out of the league, but they didn't drum anybody else out of the league for doing what he did, right? For, for standing with him, for kneeling, uh, you know, for coming out in support of him, whatever. There are other players in this league, frankly, other players who are more right wing than, than Kyrie Irving, um, who have chosen not to get vaccinated. They obviously New York cannot target all players in, in, you know, opposing markets or whatever. Um, but if Kaepernick had a case for saying like, I've been drummed out of the league unfairly, then Kyrie, I think has a case, not as big, maybe not as consequential, but has a case to say like, Hey, I've been prevented from playing when nobody else has. And, and nobody else in my situation has been, uh, you know, adversely affected, or at least anyone who's still alive has been adversely affected. You know what I mean? Like right. all these people can come and do this and I can't, it makes no sense. And I'm not yeah. saying, I, I want to clarify, like, I'm not saying that Kyrie and Kaepernick are like on the same level in terms of like uh, leadership or, or what they're causes meant to the world uh that's not what i'm saying at all i'm just saying like purely from from like an optics perspective i think it lends credence to an argument that you and i probably do not agree with mm -hmm. which is that you know you know anti-vaccination or having that stance is some kind of civil rights issue, which it just isn't, no. um, you know, and, and well, uh, sorry, actually, and so, let me, let me interject there. It's currently not, if this continues, right, then, right. That's, then, that's like, what I'm saying. Yeah, it becomes one and not like on some mass scale where we're actually talking about civil rights, like, cause like, that's the important thing when we're talking about Kaepernick and things like that, like, that's like a widespread, right, right. you know, civil rights thing. Whereas like it, what you're comparing Kyrie to is like, just Kaepernick's situation in particular, in terms of how he was interacted with by the league, has some loose ties yes. to how Kyrie yes. Irving is being treated within the league. 
And so, and if this continues, it becomes a civil rights thing specifically to Kyrie Irving, not to a broader community of people. Yes, yes. Whereas Kaepernick's is like him plus a broader group. Like, I just want to clarify. Well, like, yeah. Right, right. Well, I guess what I mean is, is, is purely in the legal sense. And that's why we want, right. I want to clarify, like he is, he is not on the level of Kaepernick, in my opinion, as, as a leader right. or, or anything like that. It is, it is purely in a legalistic sense that mm -hmm. The New York New York City is giving credence to his argument, which I would think is the opposite of what they would want to do, given that they seem, you know, still committed to, uh, you know, lowering the spread of COVID as much as possible, even without the vaccine mandate. So it it, you know, it's the idea that the the comparison between him and Kaepernick is Kaepernick's job status was affected by the things he said right and in this case also even though Kyrie is being permitted to play away games his that is part of his job status if he can't play 50 percent of his games right mm -hmm. so so like are we are we going to apply you know it, this more more to do i guess this part of it is more to do with like the court of public opinion but it's like are we going to apply like free speech principles in one area and not the other now Kyrie, for all everything we've criticized him for has not said anything you know so beyond the pale that i that i think like oh you can't defend him saying that or, or what have you um but like so, so what i mean by that is this doesn't seem, you know, I don't agree with it, obviously, but it doesn't seem so beyond the pale that uh, his job status should be affected if others job status is not being affected also. And if the way that others are able to interact within the Barclays Center is going back to normal. I, it, it, that's that's the part that that sticks in my craw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I think you've nailed all of it. It's just, it's like, we we obviously want to be in a society where like people like Kyrie Irving want to get vaccinated to help the greater cause of beating the pandemic. But like at the end of the day, you can't be holding people to a standard that you're not holding anyone else to. Like, that's just right. not okay. Like, right. Yeah. And that's that's what I meant also by like, part of what I meant by, by the Kaepernick comparison right. because they held him to a standard that they didn't hold other people to that also had his opinion also spoke out spoke out but right were like came after him like well, because, came he, after was, him and because also, he was the biggest because he was the biggest face exactly. and the biggest name perhaps in all of it right then th then people came after him because because optically if he's out of the league then that means business for us Whereas the NBA, their audience is more left-leaning, yeah. you know, on the whole. So, therefore, we're gonna we're gonna. It, it seems like uh, not the not the not that the NBA is doing it, but that uh, it, it's a similar situation in that. Right, New York he's, is. He's being yeah. He's being you know, uh, pretty much unfairly treated for basically swimming upstream. Uh, right. of where the general consensus of of the league and the city he plays in is. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, again, we're not trying to say that Kyrie Irving is, is you know, undeserving of criticism. Uh, we're not, you know, this is not like us backing off of, of the positions we've taken about him in the past. Right. It's, it's literally just, we do not understand the decisions that, uh, New York City is making, uh, and frankly, I don't understand why they're allowed to make these decisions uh, to begin with. In the sense that they wouldn't say, like, you couldn't, because they're basically saying, like, entertainment workers, the vaccine mandates lifted. Is Kyrie not an entertainment worker? Right. I don't understand. Exactly. No, no exactly. Know. It's it really comes down to if it has to be an industry wide like rule like if you had said right. somehow that like that the industry as a whole because of like the number of people you come in contact with like on a daily basis like 
it does make you more susceptible to spreading COVID. Okay, that's the whole industry. But you are specifically targeting a basketball team. Like, well, and not even a basketball team, one player. Well, but he has the option to get vaccinated. You are, they're targeting the Brooklyn Nets, and he's the only one on the Brooklyn Nets that is unvaccinated. Um, so, like, in terms of targeting, like, it is targeting one player, but like, at the same time, like, the rule would presumably, if there was a second unvaccinated player on the Brooklyn Nets, they also would fall under that category. Right. 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 So yeah. you're, you are specifically like, targeting. They wouldn't quite, I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think they're, I don't think they would be able to uh, make any sort of case if it was two or more players. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. But yeah. even, even if it's one player, like it doesn't, it does no. the, the, this doesn't hold any water because as we've said, it, it seems very hypocritical. Um, yeah. So uh, we will see what happens with all of that. Um, and our last uh, subject today, I uh, just kind of wanted to run down uh, some of the players that are going to need to uh, have a strong performance, not because they're, you know, uh, they're anything bad or whatever. It's just that this is the way the NFL draft goes. The players that need to uh, have their stock rise within the NFL draft combine, which is coming up later this week. Um, it, you know, a lot of it to me, I'm very, very focused on, on the linebacker position this time around. When you look at Troy Anderson from Montana State, um, I think he gets devalued a little bit just because he comes from that smaller school. But mm -hmm. he's being talked about as, you know, a potential uh, second rounder. Um, but a lot of people have him, you know, going in the third round uh, or early day three. And I would say if he has a strong performance uh, this this uh, this week, I think he probably gets into the second round. Uh, also, in terms of linebacker uh, Brian Asmoa from Oklahoma, uh, I'm wondering if maybe he could vault himself into the second round as well. Um, there's a lot of names here. I've, I've got a whole uh, list in front of me. Leo Chennault from Wisconsin, how far up the board can he get? He could, another linebacker, he could potentially um, go all the way into the first round, in my opinion. Um, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but that's a position of need for a lot of teams. Um, and there's really only like two or three like elite, elite guys right now um, coming into this draft. Uh, and then his, his linebacking partner, if you like, at Wisconsin, Jack Sanborn, um, he's not gonna be you know, a day one guy, but, uh, you know, how far up the board can he get? Um, also, you have Iquanu, obviously, probably the biggest riser at O-line uh, that I've ever seen, um, because not a lot of people were talking about him. I I liked him, uh, you know, looking at players initially uh, as this draft process started, but in a, in a draft class with a lot of great O-linemen, he has risen way up people's board to the point where I, I potentially think the Jaguars could take him number one overall. I, mm -hmm. I would, I would see no problem with that. So, uh, it came from, uh, North Carolina state, uh, a huge name to look out for. Um, also Luke Fortner, uh, another alignment from Kentucky, you know, where does he end up? He's not going to be day one or probably even day two. Um, but he's, he's a name people should, should be looking out for. Um, Daniel Faele, uh, another offensive lineman from Minnesota. Um, how far up the board can he get? Probably a day two guy. Um, trying to find, I had, I know I had another alignment. Well, Zion Johnson, uh, played a lot of, at guard at Boston college. Um, but he seems very versatile. Um, so how far could he get Braxton Jones, another offensive lineman. Um, so I say all that to say basically like, again, this is not a draft for quarterbacks. Uh, this is a draft for defensive talent and offensive line. Uh, you know, it's just riddled with that across the board. Um, but in terms of quarterbacks, I think the number one person who needs to have a strong performance, um, and, and maybe maybe I'll do like one and one A. Um, my one would be Sam Howell. Um, you know, he started off this process as basically people's consensus number one, um, but I think as people saw Malik Willis at the Senior Bowl and uh, just kind of looked at tape of Willis in general. Willis has risen way up people's board just because it's not the strongest year for quarterback, but he 
has all of these insane uh, traits that he's not he's not going to be like the most developed pocket passer right away. But if he can give you those huge plays, you'd rather have that than somebody who's going to be potentially even a long longer term uh, project. Um, so you know that that's going to be interesting. And then I want to see where Matt Corral is going to end up because to me, in my opinion, he is the best of mm. anybody that I've looked at. And I would I would just be over the moon if the if the Panthers were to uh, were to take him. Um, probably won't happen. I'd be very happy with Willis as well. Um, but uh, you know, Corral, he's not going to do. Uh, he's not going to participate in the drills due to his ankle injury. Um, so he's going to need to impress in interviews and, and that sort of stuff and, and being around, uh, people. And there's always, you know, little stories that come out here and there about that, even though that, you know, obviously that's not all televised. Um, and just to, just to round it out, uh, going back to defense, uh, another person that I think, uh, needs a strong performance, uh, also due to injury is Derek Stingley Jr. Uh, corner from LSU. Um, uh, you know, he probably goes in the top 10, but I, I just, I, I, it's going to depend a lot on what he does uh, in this combine. Um, so I think there's a lot like, you know, so to wrap it all up, I think there's just a lot of guys that are just on that bubble. Even a, a Jamari Sawyer, I just saw his name, uh, O'Lyman from Georgia. Uh, so again, there's a lot of guys that could rise or fall based on, on this combine. And I think this year's combine is so interesting in that sense, because it's, it's so much more than, than usual um, that this point in the process is very important, partly because it's not a loaded quarterback year. So not as many of these guys that are big names in this draft are going to have like a really uh, talked about pro day, because usually the pro days, that are talked about the most are quarterback pro days. Um, so that's why I'm saying like this, this combine, maybe ever since I started really following the NFL draft in such a big way, might be the most uh, interesting combine uh, to follow, you know, and, and see who rises and falls. Yeah, that's really interesting. I like the breakdown that you gave there. I don't, I'm not one that follows a lot of college football. And so a lot of times it's sort of like post draft that I start getting to know a lot of these players. I'll sort of keep tabs on the combine, combine to see who like stands out. But to me, like the number one thing that came out there was just that this really is like a draft where the combine really matters for quarterbacks, like other yeah. drafts, you know, like quarterbacks don't really rise and fall based on the combine unless like, unless someone just has like a terrible combine performance, there's no like, I've never really seen some a quarterback, you know, rise out of the combine because like at the end of the day, like there's a lot of film already out on you. And so like the combine isn't showing us really anything that we haven't already seen. Like it might right. reassure us one way or another, but it's not going to like rise your stock very much. Um, and so this year's the first time that I can remember where this actually matters for quarterbacks because it's, there's such a dearth out there. Like, I mean, and there's so many teams that are hungry for a quarterback but like not a lot of quarterbacks on the market. Like it, it's looking like Jimmy G might stay in San Francisco. And if that's the case, then it's like, who actually is going to be available? Will Aaron Rodgers right. be available? Like will, will Kirk Cousins? Like we really don't know. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. Like, I think it's, it's going to make this draft super, super like upside down almost because like, uh, I don't think a lot of quarterbacks are going to go high, but I think there's still going to be plenty to go in the first round, but it might be like, lower in the first round actually um mm -hmm. some, some of those early teams might take a swing but i think what they might end up doing is they might go you know what we don't know who that is like we're gonna get somebody who's a known quantity and then we're gonna go all in on trying to get a quarterback through a trade or something um before that well and i think there's gonna be a lot more trade trades down uh mm -hmm. from those top teams than people anticipate i think the yeah. panthers would be wise to do that to be honest yeah. with you not to always take it back to them but i you know, you're sitting there at six and you don't have a second round pick or a third round pick. If you can trade down and still get one of the better QBs in this draft and then also get some O-line help, which this is, again, one of the best drafts ever for O-line, I, mm -hmm. I think you'd be highly incentivized to do that. Because if, mm -hmm. you, if you sit there and take 
you know, they've been talked about for Pickett and then obviously Willis. Uh, if you sit there at six and take them, that's a reach. As much mm-hmm. as I think those two guys have the potential, and I would I would say my top three would be Willis Pickett and and uh, Corral, but mm-hmm. I it, it really would be wasting a lot of potential resources you could have by by trading that pick down. So mm-hmm. I I just I think that would be smart. I think you know there's obviously other teams uh, like I look at the Eagles having three picks. In the top 20, they have 15, 16, and 19. I think they're probably going to trade one of those picks up uh, mm-hmm. because there's so much good defensive talent right at the top that would really help right. them. Um, and then they could sit there and take one of the best receivers uh, you know, still available at that point. So mm-hmm. we shall see uh, all of that, you know, how all of that plays out this week, and we'll have kind of a report back about the combine. Um, also you know, in connection to this, in the next couple of weeks, we will be doing uh, a first round uh, mock draft between the two of us. You know, we'll kind of go back and forth and uh, and see where we end up there, see what we predict happening. Um, but we'll do one before uh, free agency begins, before the new league year begins, and then after, you know, the flurry of activity that we expect, whenever that kind of ends or cools off, then we'll do, you know, another mock draft in preparation for uh, the actual draft. So, um, yeah. So with that being said, uh, we will, uh, we'll see you next time.